Hey, well, thanks for joining in today and joining us for the second FE Real Review Session here. And uh, it's so glad to have you joining us for FE Review Session 2022, and this session is static. So if you want links to the rest of the playlist, you can look down below where each week this semester we'll be going through different series or, or different topics. So today we're doing statics. Last week we did math. We're sort of jumping over a little bit here, like engineering, economics, and ethics, with the idea that we'll come back to those later. But statics is so foundational here that I want to get this in and I kind of want to go through some of the pieces of it to make sure that this is like this is there for the rest of your review right so as you get in we started with math we kind of went through the whole idea of how to use your calculator and I brought that up a bunch last time we'll, we'll deal with some calculator things today not quite as much today what we're really focusing on is is like three major things and one here is uh, where did my pen go? There it is. One is just going to be sum of forces in the x direction equals zero. If you ever took a statics course with me, I mean, this is like uh, sum of the forces in the x direction, sum of the forces in the y direction equals zero. So you have to know how to sum uh, forces, right? So you have to know, uh, you know, how to do this. And this isn't just like vector mechanics. You might have taken a class with vector mechanics and, and you learned IJKs and how to do all that. This is just kind of the bare bones. This is what I used when I was practicing as a consulting engineer for over a decade. This is the basic stuff of how to make things balance. So they work, all right? And then in addition, we have to know some of the moments. So we're gonna deal with some moments about a point like over and over again today, and that has to equal zero. So these this is just like kind of balancing right this is the balancing act like all the forces need to balance all the rotations need to balance and that's what we're trying to do in statics and you might be saying okay that, that, that's that's good mark um and honestly i i went through and, and tried to explain this to my wife at one point and she's like mark that looks like greek <laughs> i was like yeah you're right this is kind of greek here but that's okay you guys can still learn this uh you can still do this we use sigma uh for for what's going on here but but these basic equations right where a moment equals a force times a perpendicular distance right if you can do those those things and throw in like a little bit of like 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 some basic trig here like for example the cosine of an angle uh equals the adjacent over the hypotenuse right or you can do the sine of an angle equals the opposite uh over the hypotenuse if you can get those things down you can master this static section. I, I 100% believe it. And I, I, I know that this is going to help you master and pass and crush the FE when you get there. So to do that, and the way that all these review sessions work is I kind of just start with the FE spec. So I just come over here and I start and say, okay, this is what NCS puts out there. I'm just going to take it and look at it and look at these different pieces here and say, let's come up with some problems for it. All right. So that's what we're going to do. We're just going to work through each of these sections, result on a four systems. Uh, I've also talked to some people that have recently taken the test and those people have given me some feedback on, Hey, I saw this. I didn't see that. I saw this idea that, you know, I'm not taking exact questions, but like I, I get their feedback on what was on the test to try to bring that in. And you'll see that a little bit today um, as we go through as well. So, you know, let's get started. I mean, this is fun. So this is great. So we're just going to jump in here. This is the first, you know, first question. And honestly, this is where I start my first statics class. Where I first, where I start my first statics class is just this basic idea. Uh, uh, th this is just the basic idea of forces as vectors, right? And when we start to look at these forces, I put these down, just two basic forces. And the question asks, okay, I've got a force, this force one, right and that's 220 kilonewtons so this is just you know 220 kilonewtons uh we've got force two and force two here is 240 kilonewtons okay so we've got these forces and there's going to be some third force right the, these forces if you add them together are going to make some third force here and this third force is going to come up here i, I don't have the, the whole you know the, I, I can't show it to, to scale here just because of the way the problem's set up, but they're gonna create some third force. And, and that's what we're asking for. We're asking for that resultant force, the magnitude of the resultant. And really one of the things that you wanna do is you wanna be able to sort of read these questions quickly. You get what, three minutes per question. So you wanna be able to sort of look at the question, maybe circle or highlight the important things, and then just parse out what they're asking for. So when these forces are added together, the magnitude of the resultant, is most nearly right so what do we have to do we just need to use some basic trig here and the way that i like to do that 
is I like to show uh, force components. So I like to show force components like this. So I, you know, I might call this one F one Y, and I have another component here that's that would be called F, you know, one X. And then similarly on this side, I'm gonna have some components here. So F two Y and F two X. So these components, when you add them together, it, this this works. So Ibrahim. Um, moments we'll talk we'll talk moments in a little bit so we will get there I just saw that chat box you know so feel free to put things in the chat um, it's just me here so I just do this just for fun kind of and for my class here uh, where I, I'm teaching this stuff so you know so so if I don't see your chat right away just let me know just keep you know keep pinging me so um, yeah so so moments we'll get there we'll get there don't worry but moments just a force times the distance. The whole idea with statics, let me just take a step back for a second. The whole idea with statics is we're trying to balance things. We're trying to balance forces vertically. We're trying to balance forces horizontally. And we're trying to balance them so they don't rotate, right? Because that's what static is. It's not moving, right? So we just want those to balance. And once they balance, we're happy, right? And here, one of the things is we're not looking to make these balance. I mean, we could say, okay, maybe we have a resultant force that's acting down, but we're, we're not even worried about that. We just, we're adding these two vectors together. And when they add together, they're going to create some third vector, right? So, I mean, if we were to look at this as well, we could say like, okay, well, we have F1 adding here and we have F2 adding here and we're going to come up with some third vector, right? So if we, if we did like vector notation, uh, we could do that, right? But it's going to be easier uh, for you on the test, I think, is is to use just basic trig. Okay, so I start with this, and I start with some different angles here. So I start with, you know, you have a 60-degree angle for, for one side here. You have a 30-degree angle on another. You have this slope triangle thing going on. So let's just jump in and take a look at what that looks like. So we're going to start with this, and we're going to – let's just start with F1. So F1 – uh, we said was 220 kilonewtons. F1x equals what? Well, the way that I start is I just like to I just like to think that what's the cosine? The cosine is the adjacent over the hypotenuse, right? And you don't need ij's and k's to do that, right? But we can we can just start there, adjacent over hypotenuse. So so in this whole force triangle thing going on, F1 we have an adjacent F1x is adjacent to uh, this angle or to uh, this this F1 here F1x is adjacent by an angle of 60 degrees so what I can say is I, I can say that this is basically just gonna be F1 times the cosine of 60 degrees and similarly I could write F1y is just gonna equal F1 times what well I can either say the sine of 60 or since this F1y is adjacent here with this 30 degree angle I can say that it's going to be the cosine of 30 degrees. Okay, so we can do those out with the calculator. Uh, when I did that out in the calculator, the cosine of 30 is one half, so I'm just going to get 220 times one half, and that's going to be what I think 110 kilonewtons. And if I make mistakes, uh, I I do make mistakes. I I, I did proof <laughs> proof these a little bit more than uh, maybe the last time I did this. The last time I kind of just threw it together, but this time I I, I tried to uh, put a little bit more effort into. Um, not making as many mistakes and I think I already made one so there we go so what's what do we got we have um, f1 which is 220 times the cosine of 60 is 220 cosine 60 is 110 uh, kilonewtons and 220 times the cosine of 30 is going to be what 190.5 Okay, and so I mean, this is this is the start of it, right? And then similarly, oops, similarly, if we come over here, we can do F two. We know F two equals uh, two hundred and what forty kilonewtons. And, and again, I'm not I'm not breaking this into ijs and k's. I'm not using unit vectors here. I'm just using basic trig, right? But you might be looking at this and saying, okay, I don't have an angle anymore, and how do we do it? Well, the thing that I like to, to look at are these 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 uh, you know these triangles where we have essentially a three four and five triangle. So if you take the square root of three squared plus four squared Pythagorean theorem, 
we get we get a three four five triangle. And what we know here is basically what's let's look at this. The cosine, the cosine of this angle here, of this angle right here, right? And I don't know if you can see my red mouse there, but the cosine of this angle down here is gonna be what? The cosine is just equal to adjacent, which is the three over the five. Okay? So what that means is we can say, well, f2x equals f2 times what? Times the cosine uh, of that angle, which is just 3 over 5. Right? So 240 times 3 over 5 is equal to 144 kilonewtons, if I did it right, and know how to use my, my, my calculator. So read the question to make it clear, please. Okay, so when the forces are added together, so basically what we're saying is, um, I'm coming back here for you, Abraham. But F1 plus F2, when the forces are added together, so they're added, we get a resultant force, some resultant force F3. What's the magnitude of F3? Right, so that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the magnitude of this, num uh, of this vector. So F3, the magnitude of that vector. That's what we're looking for. And all I'm doing to start here is trying not to move all these things around because that didn't work so well. So let me... Let me back up here. So all we're doing to start with is trying to find components. Okay. So we're just trying to find components and I'm just using basic trig to get there. And one of the reasons I want to start here is because you have to know kind of where the cosine and where the, these angles go and how to use them. Okay. So that's just the starting point. But F2Y is going to be similar. It's going to be F2 times, well, if we're looking at this triangle here, right, we're going to have essentially the sine component. So sine is four fifths. So that's what we're going to use, four-fifths here. And if we take four-fifths of 240, we're going to get like 192 kilonewtons. And honestly, that almost is enough to finish the problem. Because when we look at this, what you can kind of see is these F1s and F1x and F2x kind of cancel out. They're, they're not exactly the same but you get this 110 and you get 144, they're pretty close. I mean, if we look at, you know, if we call this vector F3, right? It, the, the question said just the magnitude. It just said, the question just said the magnitude. So this is just the magnitude and that's all that we want. So if we're looking at F3, right? Basically that's this, the result. And we're gonna start with F3X and what's that? We're basically gonna say, I'm just gonna manually assign a sign here. I'm gonna say anything to the right is positive. So that means I'm gonna have minus F1X. Right, this, this this F1 is is going to the left, I'm gonna call it negative. And to the right, I'm gonna say it's positive. So F2X, I'm gonna say is, is positive here, F2X. Okay, so um, if it's going to the left, we're gonna call it negative. If it's going to the right, we're gonna call it positive. So that's that's where we start. So what does this work out to? This is just, you know, negative 110 kilonewtons plus 144 kilonewtons. And 110 from 144 is what, 34? kilonewtons so not a not a huge amount but f f3y here you will see is, is bigger right in here what we're going to say is when we're summing vertical forces so this is summing you know horizontal forces when we're summing vertical forces or, or the y direction we're going to say anything that's up that is positive that's just the sign convention i'm going to use so the sign convention says up is positive so f1y and f2y they're both going up they're both going to be positive so all i need to do here is say uh, f one y plus f two y what's that it's just going to be 190.5 kilonewtons plus 192 kilonewtons and when we add that up i think i got like 382.5 kilonewtons okay and i i mean if if we're looking at that um right what's the magnitude well the magnitude is just going to be the magnitude of f3 is just going to be equal to essentially the square root of of f3x squared plus f3y squared. So this is essentially, again, just Pythagorean's theorem, right? Because if we're thinking of f3 as some, some vector that comes here, we're gonna have some small f3x, we're gonna have some big f3y, and this is gonna be our f3. And we're just looking at essentially Pythagorean's theorem to get the magnitude. So nothing too crazy, but uh, when we take the square root of, what, 34 squared and 382.5 squared, I think we get about 384 in the, that ballpark, the range of 384 kilonewtons. So let me know if I did something wrong because I make mistakes, you know, and it's, it's nice to never make mistakes, but 
Uh, we try. We, we tried. So, so if that looks good, I mean, I don't know. Somehow this got selected, but but what that looks like here is the 380 uh, kilonewtons is the appropriate magnitude. But the reason I start there is just because these forces and these vectors, they, they're sort of weird at times. But if you can get this basic trig down, and really, the, this is really the basics of the cosine, right? The cosine or the sine, I mean, if you get the basics of this down, you can get the basics of what's going on here and do an awesome job with it, all right? So that's, that's, that's question number one. If anybody has questions, you know, put them in the chat. I'll try to check that every once in a while. I got to look off my screen here a little bit to do it, but uh, hopefully that works. So, so yeah, I mean, we could redefine this different ways. Maybe you learned it as we're always going to take the, the, the measurement from, you know, the x-axis or something. But honestly, for me, I just like to break it down into as simple as I can uh, to make the fewest amount of mistakes that I can. So let's go to question two so question two is one of those ones that i added on to this review uh partly because i was talking to somebody that literally just took the fe in january and he said hey i had a, I had a just a, a, a basic question to give me a triangle load a, a rectangular load and said where's the force that's the equivalent force for those you know those those uh those the, the, that set of distributed loads right so this is a this is a legit uh, this is a legit FE type question. I mean, it was it was literally something similar to this, or this concept was on the FE recently. So let's let's take a look at this. I, I mean, basically, what you have going on here is this is that whole idea of balancing, right? We've got some forces, and these forces are going down, right? So these these distributed forces are all going down, and we know we have some force here that's going to go up. So what we want to do is we just want to balance those. So how do we balance them? We have to basically use that first equation that we talked about. This question reads, the magnitude of force F, so this force F, at some unknown distance X, I added in the unknown there, but at some distance X, as shown below, that will cause vertical and rotational equilibrium. Again, this is the vertical, rota vertical equilibrium is some of the forces in the Y direction equal zero. Okay, I can write my sigma a little bit better, but the sum of the force in the Y direction equals zero. That is this vertical equilibrium. So we can start there. Uh, rotational equilibrium is just going to be some of the moments about some point equals zero. And that's it. Once we get that down, uh, we have the answer to this question. Okay, so those are the two things that we're trying to solve for. So let's jump in with that. So to do that, what I personal uh, like to what I personally like to do when I see loads like this is I like to break them up so I'm just gonna put a couple highlighters on here and I'm gonna say we're gonna treat this triangular load one way and we're gonna treat this rectangular load another way you could probably go into your FE reference handbook and find like a centroid of a trapezoid or something like that but personally I don't remember that formula and I teach this stuff okay so I don't remember that formula I don't expect you to what I do expect you to remember is the area of a triangle formula because you learned it in probably about like third grade I mean I'm serious like my my nine-year-old I think knows the area of a triangle formula so if you can do an area of a triangle formula you can solve this problem okay eh, not, not exactly but it, it starts there okay so what we want to do is what we want to do is we want to find the resultant force for this triangle so i'm going to label that rt we want to find some resultant force for this rectangular load so i'm going to call it rr and then we want to uh some forces that's that's kind of step one and then step two is going to be some moments so let's jump in and we'll first look at the triangular load so if we say rt what's the what's the resultant for or triangular load you, you already got this right so uh basically what we're going to do is one half w times l Okay, so that's the one half, and if we look at this, this is the uniform load times the length of the load, right? And, and basically here, in this case, all that we're gonna get is one half of what? 22 kilonewton meters times the length of the load, and what you can see there is that's three meters. So one half of 22 is 11 times three is gonna be uh, 11 kilonewtons. Okay. Uh, similarly, if we look at our R, this is just the area of a, of, a, of a rectangle. So all we're doing here is we're taking the area of a rectangle 
and we get essentially W times L because we no longer have the one half for the triangle and we get the 22 kilonewtons per meter times its length of four meters which is a 88 uh, kilonewtons and now what we can do is we can sum forces right so if we sum forces in the y direction you guys are ahead of me on the chat and that that's very cool uh, and honestly I take longer to talk through this I'm so glad to see you guys getting this in like the three minute solution but basically what, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say RT is going down so we're gonna subtract that our R is going down we're gonna subtract that we're gonna add F here and that's gonna equal zero so basically we're gonna get F is just the sum of you know these values which uh, if everybody else did it right where it is just going to be 121 kilonewtons right it looks good right so that's the value of the force so right away we know that we can cross out you know these two so the next question is rotational equilibrium right so we got we, you know we got this this uh, vertical equilibrium the forces are balancing but we need to put it in a place like where's that point that we're going to put it so that it can uh, actually rotationally balance right um, where's kind of the fulcrum of this of this seesaw right and yeah so I I like to create points of where to do that so I'm gonna call this point a at the left side it's a great place to start uh, because it's a is a good starting spot you know but in general it's a great place to start because that's how X has been defined already so we defined X and uh, in that that sort of should work for you so uh, what we're going to do here is, yeah, so if we come down here and we do kind of number two, let me get the, the right color here. We're just going to sum moments about point A and call that equal to zero. And the, the sign convention that I use is counterclockwise is positive, clockwise negative. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to say RT times its moment arm. So I'm just going to call that the arm uh, for the triangle, a, a for the triangle. And I'm going to call it negative. Why am I calling it negative? I'm calling it negative because if you if you rotate this thing about point A, right? If if you look at that, that direction is opposite of our positive sign convention, so that's going to be negative. Okay, so I'm again I'm I'm not going into like like crazy formulas here. I'm just using kind of basic moments of force times the distance. I'll come back to what that that moment arm is. Uh, let's take a look at this rectangular one as well. That one's going in the same direction, right? And it's a, it's a clockwise rotation, so clockwise rotation is going to be negative, so that's RR times the A for the rectangle, the, the moment arm for the rectangle, right? And then what we're doing basically here is we're saying plus F times X. Why plus? Well, it's plus because this force is coming counterclockwise, which is the same direction as our, sign, our positive sign convention. So all that needs to equal uh, zero here. And essentially, somebody I think already put it in the, the chat, but, but basically what we're doing here is F times X equals RT, you know, times the, the moment arm for the triangle plus RR times the moment arm for the rectangle. And what are those arms? Well, this is where it helps to, again, I, I don't remember the, 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 the centroid formula for a trapezoid off the top of my head, but what I do remember is that if you have a triangle, it, right? If you have a triangle, and, and maybe I'll put it over here. So for, for triangular loads, so for you know triangular loads, right? Basically, what we have here is if we have the whole length is L, this resultant is going to be at two L over three from one side and L over three from the other side. Okay. So what that means is our force times our x is going to equal the, the, this RT, which we said was what 11 kilonewtons times the moment arm. And that moment arm we said is two thirds of, uh, of of the distance of the the length of the triangle. So this distance here is going to be two thirds of the three meters, which is going to be two meters. Okay. And if we look at rectangular, well, let me let me put that in first. So that's going to be the two meters. Okay. And if we look at the rectangular load, it's going to be similar. So I, I even have notes this time, you know. So this is good. Uh, so if we have the rectangular load, what do we get? The rectangular load is a little bit different here, but let's take a look at it. This is, so if we look at the rectangular loads, you don't want to be looking this stuff up on the on the uh, on. You don't want to, this is probably in the reference handbook, but you don't want to have to go look it up in the reference handbook if you can if you can avoid this because this is just kind of like basic right this is basic if you have a whole length l here 
uh, this is going to be at L over 2. Okay, so this is just like the centroid of a, of a, of a symmetrical section is going to be the middle. Okay, yeah, so, so what we get here is that's going to cut this 4 meters in half right but we have to get all the way out to the middle of it so first we have to come three meters then we have to come another two meters so our total distance here our total moment arm is going to be uh, five meters so this is the plus 88 uh, kilonewtons times five meters so when we get x we're going to we're going to solve all this you got to remember that this f here of 121 is the same f so oh, when we're all said and done, I think you plug all that in and uh, I, I think what you're getting is, uh, is uh, you are totally right. Um, so you are totally right. So X is gonna be uh, 4.2 meters, but let's go actually fix the math. So for those of you that were actually doing math, this is so helpful to me because um, I'm trying to like talk and, uh, and do this all at the same time. My notes have 33. You probably can't see them, but it says 33 in my notes. So yeah, you're totally right here. So this this should be one half times 22 is 11, right? One half times 22 is 11 times three. Uh, that gets me 33 here. And when I update that down here, uh, we should get the right answer now. So uh, does that does 4.2 work? You're totally totally right. Uh, so yeah, 4.18, uh, I believe that's right. So 33 times two, and plus 88 times five, uh, divided by our 121 is 4.18. Yeah, and, and honestly, you can't get 121 without 33 plus 88, so <laughs> thanks. Um, I, I still appreciate you guys, that's, this is awesome. So thank you so much for that. So yeah, so we have a, a force of 121, uh, we have this distance of 4.18 or 4.2, so yeah, so when you look up here to get your answer, uh, we are at answer B, right? So that gets us to the 4.2. 4. All right, so again, what we're doing here, this is, this is a legitimate FE question, like no question. Uh, like this is something, literally somebody who just took in January said they saw something similar to this, right? So this is, if you know these basics about distributed loads, uniform loads and you can do your math right and not and actually multiply uh in your calculator right that, that helps too so uh you know so 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 but but again to do this all we had to do was no two equations sum of forces equation and sum of moments equation and that is going to be able to get us there and, and i say that i say that those are the only two equations yeah we had to understand how to deal with uh these triangular loads and how to deal with rectangular loads right these distributed loads whether they're, they're linearly varying or they're they're you know flat all right but again understanding that that moment equation that force equation is huge all right let's keep going here so again equivalent force systems similar idea here right but but now we have forces shown can be replaced by a, a single equivalent moment the magnitude of an equivalent moment is most nearly so again equivalency um, what we're doing here is we're saying we have some forces, but if you notice, if we sum forces in the y direction, what's going to happen? We have minus 15 kilonewtons plus, uh, I'm sorry, plus 20 kilonewtons, uh, plus 30 kilonewtons, minus 35 kilonewtons, and then all this equals zero. And you'll notice that it does. So zero equals zero. So so the the forces are balanced vertically. So forces are balanced vertically so what the question saying is it's not saying like okay well give me a force it's the same kind of concept and that's what you're going to see on the fe you're going to see kind of a similar concept but it's going to be twisted a little bit maybe from the question that i put on here but it's going to use the same principle and that's where like if you can get these fundamentals down of how to do some of forces or in this case how to do some of moments about a point and I'm going to use point A again. You're saying, well, where's point A? I'm going to define it. In this case, right, so we're either using sum of forces or sum of moments. You can find the equivalent, right? So, so I'm going to pick a point A here. I'm just going to put this here. And then I'm going to say, okay, well, these forces, I'm just going to say they probably create some moment here, right? They balance vertically, but 
they, they're probably causing this thing to tip somehow, right? And let's check. So if we do our sum of moments equation from point A, let's see what we get. So if we sum moments about point A equals zero, we're doing the same thing that we did on the last one. It's just a little different, right? In the sense that right now, let's let's take a look at all the forces first. So if we take a look at uh, this, 20, this 20 kilonewtons here, right? So we got our 20 kilonewtons. Uh, let's let's write that in. I like to write the force down, right? A moment is equal to a force times a perpendicular distance. So 20 uh, kilonewtons times, what's the distance? The distance to this force is just gonna be the 1.5 meters, right? So nothing too crazy, 1.5 meters. Personally, I like to write those down and then kind of look back and say, okay, so what is uh, what what direction is this going and the direction it's going here is we're saying it's it's a, a counterclockwise which matches our sign convention and that counterclockwise is going to be a positive value okay so we get a positive value here I mean that's I, I can show it this way as well right what's next I, i'm just going to do all the forces first so this 30 kilonewtons times what is its arm so i'm going to again come all the way back to this point a i'm going to go all the way to my 30 and that's if you add the 1.5 and the 4 that's going to be 5.5 meters okay i'll write that a little bit more clearly and that's going to be 30 kilonewtons times 5.5 meters and again that's causing kind of a, a counterclockwise rotation so we're going to have that positive sign and then we're going to get all the way over to this 35 kilonewtons and you'll notice that this one has a longer moment arm and that one if we add the extra 1.5 meters we're going to get a total of 7 meters so 35 times 7 meters uh, and you'll notice that this one's going in a clockwise direction right so if we take a look at uh, what that looks like here right this is going in a clockwise direction and what we're going to do is because it's clockwise it's opposite of our positive sign convention we're calling it negative and then i'm going to add in this moment and some of you are thinking like okay but where you imagine what 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 distance is this moment at it's a moment it doesn't need a distance so this is where it's this is where you don't need a distance it's just a moment you don't need the distance and it's a moment it already has a distance in it right so you can take it anywhere you like. I mean, yeah, you could take it at this point. You could take it at this point. You could take it at this point. You could pick the middle of the beam. I just personally like to start at the left-hand side. It doesn't matter. I honestly go back and try this question a different from solving it from a different point. Try to solve it from this point and see if you get the same thing. You should. Okay. And this is where, when you do this question out, uh, basically what you see is this all has to equal zero for the thing to be balanced rotationally. Again, this is what we're trying to do is we're trying to balance this thing rotationally. If you put all that in, what do we get? We get 20 uh, times 1.5 uh, plus 30 times 5.5 minus 35 times 7. And we get, you know, minus 50. So that's what that's, we add the 50 to both sides. We get 50 kilonewton meters. And fortunately... We have an answer uh, that works here. So, so yeah, I mean, um, we could do that now. But honestly, I'd say when you're, you know, when you have a, an extra couple minutes, um, take a take a minute, go go solve this from a different point and see if you can get the same thing. I, I understanding these uh, these these moments equations are super super critical, and we'll go be going over them more and more uh, throughout tonight. So. Let's keep going. We'll keep going here to question four. The other thing that I wanted to tell you guys, if uh, I, I probably mentioned this before, but down below there's a link to these problems. So if you want to download them and follow along, print them out, or use a tablet and work on them that way, uh, you can certainly do that. So I make them available to you so that it's easier for you guys to uh, be able to, to use them. All right. So Question four, equilibrium. Equilibrium, again, guess what we're going to do? We're going to sum forces in the y direction. We're going to sum forces in the x direction. We're going to sum moments. So these equations, I mean, I'm just going to keep hitting them over and over and over again because they're so important. But if you can get these equations down, it's, uh, it, it's, it, it's super, super helpful. So here we have a rigid body, the mass of 1,000 kilograms and applied loads. So we get the mass of this rigid body. We get applied loads on it. 
and what we're told to solve for is the magnitude of the resultant force at support A. So we have a support A here, and we want to maintain equilibrium of the rigid body. Okay, that's great. So this is kind of just like a, a beam reactions problem. When I teach uh, my statics class, one of the things I tell my students is, you got to know beam reactions. You just got to know them. It's going to be like on almost, I, I think every every test you take in my class, is going to you got to know beam reactions and statics. It's just one of those things you got to know. So how do we do this? This is where we're just going to jump in and we're going to, we're going to, you know, do some sum of the sum of forces equilibrium equations, right? So EQ, EQ, all right. Um, so equilibrium equations, we're just going to jump in. So let's just do it. Some of the forces in the y direction. And honestly, on the FE, sometimes I slack a little. <laughs> in my, and when, it, when, you know, if you're taking my class and you're doing homework assignments, I'm going to make you draw real free body diagrams. On the FE, I don't draw real free body diagrams as much. What I'll do is I'll, I'll sort of pencil them in, right? So, uh, or, or if you have your whiteboard that you're doing, you could do a quick free body diagram of this. So why don't we? Because you, honestly, on the FE, you're going to have a whiteboard sort of like I have here. And you're going to have to draw something, right? So, so let's just draw on our free body diagram. Why not? So we're going to have our, our mass, which is going to turn into a weight once we multiply it by gravity. We're still going to have our 50 kilonewtons down. Uh, we're still going to have our 20 kilonewtons to the right. And then at point A, we have a pin, so we're going to come up with a Y. We're going to come up with a X. And I'm just assuming directions here. You can assume in any direction you want. You can assume that they're going to the right or to the left or up or down. And if you get a negative sign, it basically means you assumed wrong. And that's okay. Uh, I'm going to assume that you know BX is going to the right. So hopefully you know what these symbols are, right? So these symbols, a triangle typically is going to mean a pin where you have two uh, two reactions. Uh, a circle is gonna mean a, a roller where you get just one one reaction, okay? So this is this should work for you. And uh, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna basically be able to do this. So again, I like to show my sign convention here. Anything that's up is positive. So all that we're gonna have here is we're gonna have AY is up. We're gonna have minus W, minus 50 kilonewtons and that all has to equal zero. So AY is just going to equal what 50 kilonewtons plus a thousand kilograms times 9.81 meters per second squared. And here I'm going to pause and say what's wrong. <laughs> I know I made a mistake here. What's or I didn't even make a mistake here. What 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 else? Right? What else do we have to do here um, to make things work? This is another place on the FE where you have to be careful because you have to know your units, right? One newton equals what? One kilogram per meter, uh, um, I'm sorry, one kilogram times a meter per second squared, right? So if that's one kilogram, yeah, exactly. I need to divide this by a thousand uh, newtons per kilonewton, right? So, so the units become important here where you have to, you have to understand your units. And what that means is AY works out to be like, you know, 50, what is it, 59.81 59 uh, kilonewtons as opposed to like 5,000, you know, kilonewtons. So yeah, so, so just be careful with your units. So 59.81 kilonewtons. And some of you are going to be tempted just to go in circle 60, but don't do it. Do I suggest skipping FBDs? I can't in good conscience suggest skipping FBDs. I mean, FBDs are just, oh, they're so important. So I, I would, uh, even for like the extra like 10 seconds it took for me to draw this, I, I think I think you need to probably sketch, sketch them in. So yeah, I, I think they're gonna help you more than they're gonna hurt you. So, so some of you are gonna be tempted just to say 60. But you're wrong if, if you stop there, right? And the reason you're wrong is because this question isn't asking for the vertical force today. It's asking for the resultant force today. And this kind of is a good segue from from uh, the, the the equilibrium or you know the, the other problems that we were doing here. But basically, what this is saying is, if we look at this for a second, um, you're going to have some some ay force right some ay force up you're gonna have some ax force and those forces are going to create some resultant force and i'll call this resultant force a okay so what this means is we kind of have to go and solve for ax okay so if we solve for ax 
this is this is another one of those things where now we can choose where we want to sum moments. Where's a convenient place to sum moments? And the convenient place to sum moments on this one is going to be right at point B. And the, the, the reason I like point B for this one is because it's it cancels out the most forces, right? Essentially, AY goes right through B, uh, BX goes right through B. So we never actually have to solve for BX if, if that's where we sum moments. Okay, so let's sum moments about that point. I'm just going to move my screen up here a little bit, move my mouse up so we still have our red dot in the right spot. But let's sum moments about point B. Okay, so same sign convention. If you get used to it, <laughs> most important thing is to read the questions 100%. If you don't read the questions, you are in trouble. So definitely read the questions here, and what we're going to do is uh, we're going to keep going. So so we're going to sum moments about point B, and this is where I have to look for any of those forces that don't pass through point B are going to cause a moment about point B. Okay, so for example, we we know that BX doesn't, or I'm sorry, BX does pass through point B. Um, we know AX does not, right? AX is is some distance away from point B. So that's going to be 1.5 meters away is what the problem says. So we're going to start there. So AX uh, times the 1.5 meters, right? And then we're going to, and then we have a couple other forces. And uh, what's AX? AX is kind of coming this direction. What else do we have? I'm going to take W times, what, where's the W? Again, this kind of goes back to that rectangular thing. The weight is going to be, again, the weight's going to be half this distance because it's the rectangle. So that's going to be times two meters. And if we look at the, if we look at this in terms of which way it's causing rotation, it's causing rotation this direction. Uh, that's opposite of our positive sign convention. So we're going to do a negative value here, right? So this is causing a rotation in a clockwise direction. Uh, then we're going to keep going. We're going to say the 50 kilonewtons, and that's the same direction, uh, right? So if we take a look at that, that's the same direction here. That's the, the, the clockwise direction. That one's going to, that one's a little bit easier. That one's times four meters. Uh, and then we have to subtract, or no, we have to not subtract. We have to add that, add this 20 kilonewtons uh, times its moment arm. Its moment arm, again, we're going from point B here. So its moment arm is going to be 1.5 meters. And if we, if we put that 1.5 meters in here, uh, the reason we're gonna go with a positive is again, this is causing rotation in a, in a counterclockwise manner. The counterclockwise is what we call positive. So we're gonna say that's positive. And this hall has to balance and equal zero. So if we do all that out, yikes, what do we get? That's, that's again, it's kind of a long equation here. But uh, we have to remember that, that we're just solving for AX. So if we solve for AX, uh, let me just write this in. AX times 1.5 is going to equal this, this 9.81 uh, kilonewtons times 2 meters, you know, plus 50 kilonewtons times 4 meters, uh, plus, no, not plus. This is going to be a minus because I'm putting it to the other side, minus 20 kilonewtons times 1.5 meters. And I got, if I did this right, and you guys can you know, check me on this, but I see it up there. I think, what is it? 106.4. Yeah, I'm liking it. I'm liking it. Vlog. You got this 1220, uh, 1220 vlog. So, so 106.4. Uh, no, that's not what I got. Uh Oh, so let's check. Let's check. Let's just put it in the calculator. See 9.81 times two plus 50, uh, times four minus 20 times 1.5 um, divide that by 1.5 I got 126.41 anybody else get 126 out there in the the checking world 126.41 uh oh 113 I did this twice I honest I, I, I did this twice I even checked it and I checked it a couple times so I think I'm I think I'm right here pretty sure uh, the 126 is is doing it right so check, one of the things with this is check your signs. Uh, it's so easy to screw these up on the calculator, especially when you start moving things to the other side of the zero. So it's, it's really easy to screw those up. But if I put in uh, 9.81 here times two, you know, plus 50 times four, minus 20 times 1.5, 
Uh, divide all that by 1.5. I, 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 that this, I get the 126. So what I got was 190, or not, not 189.62, uh, 189.62 kilonewton meters. So this is essentially equal to 189.62 uh, divided by uh, 1.5 meters. Okay. Thanks, Nelson. Man, you made me feel better there. All right. So, uh, so here's just you know the 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 check that or the intermediates that I did. So if you're having issues, let me know. But again, what we're looking for here is we're looking for the resultant of this force. So I mean, picture like. If this thing were be being hung by some cable, right? If this thing were being hung by some cable, what's the result of that force? And what we see is A is just going to equal, just like we did earlier, uh, with the result in, in the first problem. What would we have? AX squared plus AY squared. So A is just going to equal the square root of, where were we? We were 59.8 squared plus 126.4 squared. And if I did this right, which I'm pretty confident, pretty confident today, uh, I get like 139.5 kilonewtons. Which hopefully, hopefully, hopefully shows up on our list and it does. So I get the 140. But again, what was it? What did we have to do? We had to know, we had to know these equilibrium equations. Once we were able to apply those things, it was good. The other, the other thing in here that you really have to be careful with is are these units. You have to know the units. You have to know the conversions. I, I don't want to have to go look up what a newton is. Okay, so that's just something like if you can save time on that and not make that mistake, that's gonna that's gonna help you. Um, and again, if you can know how to do these sum of moments equations and what a resultant force is, like a Pythagorean theorem type thing, that will help you as well. Okay. So let's keep going. Why not? You know, it's it's a Tuesday night and it's it's still fun at least. Okay. Oh man, this one this one is is interesting because it looks like I you know, I appreciate doing them. Honestly, this is one of the, this is this is fun for me in some ways. Uh, I was doing these just for my students and then I had students keep asking me like, "Hey, can we get access to those afterwards?" and I said, "I'll just do them live on YouTube and then you can have access." There you go. But Thanks for tuning in. It helps me out to, to know that you care. <laughs> so with this one, this is kind of like, guess what we're going to use? We're going to use uh, some moments and some trig on this question. So remember those three things I told you, some of forces, some of moments, and trig. Uh, again, we're, we're just going to use some moments and, and, and some trig on this one. But the question says, consider the cable system below. So, so right away, what we know is these are cables. So, so that's something to, to consider. And what's special about cables? The same thing that's special about ropes. You can't push them, right? Cables and ropes, they don't have, they, they don't have compression. They only have tension. So what that means is whatever force is in this cable, whatever force is in this cable has to line up with that cable. So that's a huge thing that you gotta understand with forces and ropes and cables and that sort of thing. You might see this question like this, uh, honestly a classic question that I give my students in first semester statics, like uh, I think every semester in some shape or form is this question. And you might see this question as well. If you have a, you know, this is something that you could totally see on the FE, right? So if you have a force hung by two cables. And this is just, uh, this is just similar to what we're doing here. It's just a step removed. So again, the FE is going to take the basic concept and maybe twist it, maybe take it a little bit removed, maybe give it to you straight up. But, you know, I'll give this to my students and we'll do a homework assignment. And then on the test, it might look like this, right? And, and what's different? Basically, it's rotated 180 80 degrees, right? Or this question might show up where you have it like this and you have a bracket, right? And you have something hanging off it, right? And, and honestly, the approach is so similar, right? And there's different techniques. You can do, you can use like law of signs and all sorts of weird, like other methods here. But I, I just want to boil this down so that if you can master a couple of things, if you can master some moments and some trig, you don't need to have special techniques, right? You can just use those principles and make them work, okay? So what we have here is, is let's take a look. So, so we know that this cable, right? We know that this cable is at some geometry of uh, essentially, what is it? We have, what do we have? We have 
one foot here and five feet here. Okay, so the, the geometry of this cable, we have one foot and five feet. So that makes this over here the square root of five squared plus one squared. I think that's the square root of 26 if I did it right. Okay, so that's, that's the geometry of the cable. This is the cable uh, geometry. With cables, with trusses, with two bar trusses, you know, bigger trusses, what you need to have and what you need to understand is this triangle that we just did here. So this triangle that we just did here, this, this, this geometry triangle is going to be similar to the force triangle, right? So the force or this P value is going to share the same exact geometry. So in other words, we're going to have PX and we're going to have PY. Right, so so the the cable geometry and the force, you know, the force. Uh, I, I like to call this the force triangle. Uh, the these are going to be similar, right? So these have a similarity to them, and these are similar triangles. So what that means is, right, this angle here and this angle here are the same angle, right? It, what it means is this angle here and this angle here are the same angle. Right, and that's gonna be super, super helpful to us. You may be thinking, why, Matt? And why, why does that help? It helps because once you think of similar triangles, or if you don't like similar triangles, let's think of cosine for a second. Okay, the cosine of, of let's say this green angle. Let's call this angle theta. Right, this green angle. Right. If we say the cosine of that angle, what is it? It's just five over the square root of twenty-six. Right. And you might be wondering, Madsen, why are you talking about all this? Because it's super important for this problem and for any trust problem, for any two-bar cable problem, you know, any, any stuff like that. So um, so what are we doing? We're trying to find this force P, right? And if we if we keep coming back to this, right, well, this cosine of that angle is 5 over 26. If we do the same thing on this side, right, so if we do the same thing over here, what do we get? We get the, 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 the cosine here is going to be, uh, the cosine of this angle theta is going to equal px over p, right? So, so same thing, same theta, same cosine. And if I get my fat head out of the way, what do we get? Well, what we see is the similar triangles tells us that you know, uh, let me write it this way: five twenty five over the square root of twenty six equals px over p, which also tells us that px equals 5p over the square root of 26 and we can do the same thing with the sign right so if we do the sign uh, we can do a similar ratio but 1 over the square root of 26 equals py over p and that's going to give us py equals uh, 1p over the square root of 26 right and why is that helpful that's super helpful because now when we sum moments right what we want to do is we want to sum moments so let's let's draw that free body diagram again Okay, so I'm going to come back here, and what we're trying to solve for again, we're trying to solve for the magnitude of this force P. We want to know what that force P is. Okay, so how are we going to solve that? Yeah, we could use the tangent and get the state angle theta, but uh, honestly, I eh, I don't like solving for angles if I don't need to. So so let's look back up here and let's draw a free body diagram. And I'm going to draw the free body diagram uh, that looks like this. So I'm going to have cable, you know, point B and point A. Okay, so what am I going to have? I'm going to have AY, I'm going to have AX, I'm going to have maybe this 200 pounds acting down, I'm going to have, what else? I'm going to have PX and PY. And in here I'm going to use the components rather than P to solve this. And you can use varying your own theorem and like apply that force P somewhere else. But all of a sudden when you do this problem, the cool thing is, let's look at this. If we sum moments about a convenient point, and the convenient point is always where you have a lot of unknowns that you're trying to get rid of. So for example, if we sum moments here at point A, right, what do we have? All of a sudden this problem gets a little bit easier because we know this, this is uh, four feet and we know the, the horizontal distance here is uh, four feet. Right, so if we if we know all of those, what we can say is let's just sum moments, right? So I'm going to start with we have PY times four feet minus two hundred pounds times four feet. Right, those are both going in the the uh, counterclockwise direction, and then I'm going to subtract off PX times four feet equals zero. That one's clockwise, right? So if we look at these moments, 
the the 200 and the py are both going uh, counterclockwise whereas the px is going uh, clockwise around point a so do you see it yet do you see it yet uh, hopefully you see that right we have we have a substitute for px here we can bring that in here we have a substitution for py here and we can bring that in here and we have one equation one unknown and we can solve this thing okay so what we can do here is i'll, I'll substitute in did I put them to the right spot i think so uh so we got what we got 5p over the square root of 26 times 4 feet minus uh i'm going to do this px was was no did i screw this up py let me let me take these off this is messing with me um so let me just back up here so py was p over square root of 26 times 4 uh, px was 5p so minus 5p over the square root of 26 uh, times 4 equals i'm just going to put this 200 over the other side so 200 pounds times 4 feet and the cool thing here is these 4 feet all drop out right so that makes this problem even a little bit easier right so i can essentially multiply both sides by the square root of 26 so if i do that i get if i multiply both sides by the square root of 26 what do i get i get p minus 5p equals 200 times the square root of 26 and actually i missed a negative sign didn't i something i missed some negative sign somewhere let's take a look no i didn't miss a negative sign i just messed up my sign look at that this sign should be positive did anybody see that probably not but this sign should be positive and Matson, what you doing you're screwing with me no i'm not screwing with you um what i'm i'm not trying to at least right so so what do we have we have um counterclockwise and counterclockwise these both need to be positive because they both match this plus do you see that so what that means is when we subtract off we get a negative 200 over on this side you see that so we get the negative 200 negative 200 works so, so this is now we get minus 4p equals negative 200 square root of 26 and we get p equals the the negatives go away essentially 50 times the square root of 26 so p equals i think that works out to 255 pounds let me put it into my calculator somebody else put it in your calculator because i i again i checked this one i'm uh i'm pretty pretty confident with this one but you know 50 squared to 26 gets us to 255 right anybody still screwed up with those uh those signs on the the moments because the moments that's where that's that's where the money is i mean that's where if you can get these signs you're, you're good but the the py and the 200 are both going in this counterclockwise direction which matches our positive sign convention so those both have to be positive the px is going the opposite direction and that one has to be negative so what we get down here sammy is is we get the p minus 5p so that goes to that it does go to minus 4p but i i essentially gave you a plus and a plus here uh to to make them both both positive when we we're all said and done okay so so good 4p we're, we're good i think so so i think we're good but again honestly um so, some sum of forces some of moments and uh some good accounting with your positives negatives you, you know your rotational arrows and that sort of thing it's so easy to make mistakes here and you see me doing it even while we're doing this and like part of it is i'm trying to concentrate part of it is uh i'm not looking back at my notes as, as much as i as, as much as i need to uh, part of it is i'm just trying to make sure i don't screw things up and in the process you screw things up but i think we're doing all right here so so let's uh let's keep going okay frames and trusses part d is is kind of the next part here uh, i threw on a method of joints truss here just because i i we we've been doing a lot of sum of moments method of sections gets into sum of moments uh we'll get into method of sections probably next week uh for sure but the, i i decided to go with a method of joints question here you might be thinking like matt you didn't even read the question that's okay let's let's read the question consider the truss and loading shown below ignore self-weight 
So the magnitude of the force in member AC due to the applied loads is most nearly. So right away we know we're looking at this member here, AC. And what we want to do is we want to find that member force. So there's a, there's a bunch of different ways you can do this. You could use method of sections. You could find uh, support reactions. You could do all sorts of things. But what I prefer with a question like this, and again, this is one of those questions that I'll throw on like a test in, in my class. Is just here's a here's a here's a truss. Go find a member force. And one of the reasons I throw these on my test is because I know that something like this will very likely show up in the epi, and I want you to be prepared for it. But what does this look like? Well, basically what this looks like here is with the method of joints, basically all you're going to do is you're going to draw one, draw, draw an FBD of a joint. And then two, you're just going to apply, guess what? <laughs> this is probably getting boring at some point. And you're thinking like, man, if I could just figure out how to do some of the forces and some of the moments, uh, I'd be a, an expert at statics, and you're absolutely right. If you could just figure out those out, you would be an expert at statics. Uh, with the method of joints, there is no sum of moments because there is no moment arm. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, let's 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 take a look at this. It, and you also need to apply a healthy dose of trig. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Let's draw a free body diagram here. I'm just going to draw the joint. So this is joint C. And what I like to do when I draw my joint is just draw the joint and then draw the forces that I know that are on it. So I know that there's 20 kilonewtons on it. I know that there's eight kilonewtons on it. What else do I know? Well, what else I know is that I've, I've, in order to draw this, I sort of had to cut through two members, right? And, and just like that cable, trusses can only carry axial force. So if you know it's this pin connected, you know, pin connected set of members with loads only at the joints, or if in the problem statement they tell you it's a truss, right? You know that these forces have to line up, just like our cables did, the forces have to line up with the members. They're either gonna be in tension or compression, but the forces, because it's not a cable anymore, but the forces have to line up. I like to draw all my forces in tension. Uh, some people like to do it a different way. Personally, I like to draw my forces in tension just because that gives me uh, a starting point. So I know if I get a positive value, I drew it in the right direction. And it's tension, right? It's, it's pulling away from the joint. And some people have an issue with that. But it's like, if we think about this for a second, if we pull away, right, this is going to be tension. It doesn't matter if you're pulling to the right or the left, you're going to be in tension. If you're, if you're pushing towards, uh, it's going to be in compression. Okay. Um, so, so I like to, you know, assume assume tension over here. And that's what I, that's what I'm doing. But I also like to label these. I'm going to label this AC and I'm going to label this uh, BC just because those are the forces and anytime I'm doing method of joints I like to also show my components and a lot of times I'll use a different color for those just to make sure that we don't get confused as to what they are but this is going to be BCY and BCX so th these are our these are our components of BC and just like with that cable problem right just like with that cable problem we know that there's some relationship between BCX and uh, BCY okay so let's take a look here and see uh, what we're doing and how we get there. So I'm going to sum. The, the beautiful thing about the method of joints is, again, there's no moment arm, right? There's no, there's no distance to any of these forces because they all are applied right at this joint. So there's no moment arm. So what does that look like? Well, the first place I have to start for this one is some of the forces in the y direction. So if I sum force in the y direction, anything up is positive. So I'm going to say minus 20 kilonewtons, right? I'm just looking at what are the forces in the y direction. So there's two forces in the y direction, the minus 20 and BCY. Okay, so if I take those here and I say minus 20 kilonewtons minus BCY equals zero, I can pretty quickly get BCY equals minus 20 kilonewtons. In that negative 20, right? The negative means, uh, this means compression. So the negative means I assumed incorrectly, and that's okay. This direction isn't actually uh, this uh, this direction isn't actually tension, and it's it's actually uh, compression, and that's okay. So the next question is, well, okay, let's take a look at my next equation. My sum of the forces in the x direction equals zero, and what do we get? Minus AC uh, minus BCX. Plus, no, I get I have minus eight kilonewtons. Yeah, minus eight kilonewtons. So they're all going to the left, right? 
uh, they're all going to left minus 8 conans equals 0. Okay, so AC is what we're trying to solve for, right? That's, that's what we're trying to solve for. So I'm going to isolate that. I'm going to put that on like the other side here and then flip everything. So I'm going to AC equals, you know, minus BCX uh, minus 8 kilonewtons. And you might take a deep breath and say, Matt, and that's great, except what happened to BCX? We don't have BCX. How do we get BCX? And that's again where this this uh, you know this this is where we get this healthy dose of trig to come in to solve that. Okay, so just like we did with that cable problem, we're gonna say we know BC right has some geometry, and that geometry of BC is essentially a five and three triangle. Okay, so we're gonna come down here and we're gonna say BC has some geometry. It's three meters vertically, five meters horizontally. Yeah, so this is going to be the square root of 25 plus 9. What's that? The square root of 25 plus 9. I don't even know what that is. It's just the square root of 5 squared plus 3 squared. And honestly, I don't care. Because the FE doesn't care about all the intermediate work. The FE just wants you to get the right answer. Okay, so what are we going to look at? We're looking at BC. Is This is BC. We also know that these triangles are going to be similar, just like on that cable problem, because the force has to line up with the member. So the force has to line up with the Mach member. Mike, you got it, man. Um, similar triangles, right? So these, these triangles are similar. They're the same angles. And what we know is if we have, uh, the, if we're trying to find BCX, right? BCX over BCY has to equal, what? Five over three, which means BCX equals five thirds of BCY or BCX equals 5 thirds of negative 20. So 5 over 3 times minus 20 is uh, minus 33. 0.33 kilonewtons. And that, interestingly enough, will get us our answer. So minus times a minus 33.33 kilonewtons. Uh, minus 8 kilonewtons equals, actually we already have that equal to something. So uh, basically, these negatives go away. We get a positive when we get AC equals, what's that, 33.33 plus or minus 8, I should say, minus 8. It's like 25.33 kilonewtons. And you were hoping trusses went away after you got done with statics. I know, it's, it's, ah, but like, again, the fundamental concepts here. Can you sum forces? Can you sum moments? Can you apply that basic trig to go from one to the other? And honestly, what you'll notice here is I haven't used the reference handbook so far. And that's okay. Like, I mean, you can use look this stuff up in the reference handbook. But I would say work at the statics problems until you get to the point where you don't need the, you don't need the reference handbook to know how to sum forces in some moments and use the basic trig, okay? There are some pieces where, I, I honestly, I'll pull it up here in a minute uh, when we get to like moments of inertia and that sort of thing. But so there are some pieces where it's going to help. But <laughs> can't fiddle the bridge, you know. Sometimes bridges fall down because of bad trusses. But you know, we we don't like to see that. We try to make it work. So what do we get? Yeah. So so the answer here should be that twenty five uh, kilonewtons. And interestingly enough, if I asked you, right, what do we know? This is a positive value, so that's going to mean this one's in tension. So the arrow was drawn in the the correct uh, direction. Okay. So again. The, kind of the basics, some forces, some moments, and, and we're pretty good. All right, this one is intense, but uh, it looks it looks harder uh, than it, it is. CB has an X component. Yeah, it, it totally does. So I'll just come back there for one second. So CB totally has an X component, or BC, whatever you want to call it. Uh, BC has that X component here that we solved for. So that's where the, the easy answer is just to say, well, this eight must be taken by here. And it's, that's wrong. I mean, that's just a, that's, that's for people that aren't like you that are studying that are going to get this right. Okay. So let's go to the next, the next one. This looks intense and it is, but guess what? You can solve it with a sum of moments equation. Okay. So the approach to this uh, questioning, I, I mean, this is just becoming a little bit of a broken record and I hate, I hate it, but like, honestly, I asked some of my students, uh, one of them that just passed the test, I said, what's the key to statics? He's like, you just got to do it over and over again. You just got to do it until eventually it clicks. 
Uh, I asked another guy who passed it last year. I said, so what, what, what do you think were some of your strengths? He said, statics. I was like, really? I like, yeah. Like, I, I felt like I, I finally got it. It's like, it finally made sense to me. Like, I was able to get it. And, like, uh, honestly, like, I, that was, that surprised me from his standpoint that, like, you know, that, that was his, that, that's what he would come back with as a strength. But I think it's one of those things that practice, practice, practice with, with your statics. So here you know we have a rectangular load a triangular load okay so um, we have a rectangular load RR we have a triangular load RT and we have to sum a moment and this gets a little bit more complicated because it's a frame but not much more honestly it's not much more because remember what a moment is a moment is a force times a perpendicular distance right so if we're looking at this we we all of a sudden let's actually let's read the question first uh, before I just jump in I, I'm just excited today because I love statics, right? What do we get? We get consider the rigid frame and applied loads below. So again, frames, trusses, um, ignore the self-weight, the magnitude of the vertical reaction at D. So we're going to have some vertical reaction here. Due to the applied loads, again, so applied loads means no self-weight. Um, due to the applied loads, so we have the vertical reaction at D due to the applied loads is most nearly. So do you see it yet? Basically, we're going to have some, you know, support reactions at AY. We're going to have some support reactions at AX. But ultimately, all that we're doing here is we're just doing a sum of moments equation. So this equation looks really terrible. And if I wanted to, you know, if I wanted to um, make it even worse. Ibrahim, just to point out, like, also, if you look down in the link below, there's a, a link to the question. So if you want to see them while I'm going, uh, you can totally download them as well. If I wanted to make this question more complicated, my you know, my students hate me for when I do this, but you could have to find these components and that gets annoying too. We're not going to do that tonight, but if you want to, go back and try that. Okay, so, oh man, that, that's, a, that's another fun question. But let's take a look at this. We're just trying to find that vertical reaction at D, okay? And what do we get? We're just going to sum moments about point A. Why point A? Because we don't need AX and AY, we don't know AX and AY, and honestly, at this point, we don't care about AX and AY because all we want to do is solve this problem, pass the FE, get the $6,000 raise, and move on towards our PE, right? So, so if we sum moments about point A, let's take a look at this. What we're going to have is RR times its arm. What's it, the moment arm for RR? This is where you, you have to look at that perpendicular distance. And do you see it? I mean, we could use the components, but here, why would you? This is it's so much easier if you could if you can look at this and come up with the perpendicular distance to that load. So if you can find that distance, that's great. But you're thinking, Mattson, but we don't have that distance. And you're right, we don't have that distance, but what do we have? What we know is, we know that this distance is six, this distance is eight. And if you remember your fancy fun triangles, right? Uh, we have a six, eight, six, eight, 10 triangle, which is similar to a three, four, uh, five triangle and if we go halfway to the six and halfway to the eight that puts us exactly at essentially a three four five triangle right so what that means is this distance halfway through the beam is going to be five feet okay so again that, that kind of the basic geometry the fundamental geometry if you can get that stuff down you're doing you're doing all right so we have rr times five feet which way is that going right so this is going uh what's that that's that's clockwise right so that's a clockwise moment that's going to be negative okay we're going to do the same thing with rt rt uh, times its moment arm what's its moment arm again we're going to come from point a all the way over to the center of this thing where's the center well we come six feet plus three feet so that's a total of uh, nine feet and again, if we look at this thing, this is kind of go, which direction is that? That's a, a clockwise direction. So that's going to be negative. Same thing with the seven kips. I'll just stay here. Seven kips is going clockwise. So we're going to subtract the seven. If I get the right pen here, uh, we're going to subtract the seven kips times the total distance here. So this total distance, six plus nine plus three plus three. Um, you can put that in your calculator, you can do it in your head. Six and six and six is twelve plus nine is that twenty-one, I think. I think that's twenty-one. Twenty-one feet. And then the last one that we, we need here is this, you know, we have this distance to uh, the distance here to point D. And that's gonna be six plus nine plus three. So six plus nine is fifteen plus three is eighteen. 
right? So, you know, if this one's coming clock, uh, clockwise, what we see is that the dy is, again, it's going which way? This, this dy is going counterclockwise, which is the same as our positive sign convention, and that's going to make that one positive. So dy times uh, 18 feet equals zero. And this just becomes a, a calculator practice. The, the question looks super intimidating because it is, uh, but, but when you break it down, it's one equation and one unknown. And if you know, if you know how to sum moments, hopefully uh, you can make that work. So, so let's go through this and add our resultant forces here, our, 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 our T. Okay, uh, and we will uh, make that work. So RR is, again, whenever you see a load that looks like a rectangle, you're just integrating the area of it essentially to get your 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 total load. So RR is going to be minus what? This is two kips per foot times 10 feet. Okay, and then we're going to multiply that by the five feet still. The RT, this is a, a triangle, so we're going to say one half two kips per foot times a uh, total of nine feet, right? So that one goes, this one goes a total of nine feet here. Okay, in that one, we can't forget to multiply it by the nine feet as well. That's the moment arm, although it's so easy to make those mistakes. Uh, and then minus seven times, you know, kips times 21 feet, and then plus dy times 18 feet equals zero. So good grief, that's a nice long equation, but uh, against again we get something here uh oh 16.25 I don't think I got 16.25 uh, what did I get so if I put in 2 times 10 times 5 uh, plus 0.5 times 2 times 9 and plus 7 times 21 I get like 256 kip feet is going to equal dy times 18 feet so if we divide that by 18, I get like dy equal to like 14.2. Uh, uh oh, what did I do wrong? Now, now I did do something wrong. <laughs> I know I did. Uh, so let's look. Two times 10 is 20 times five. That's good. One half times two times nine is nine times nine. Seven is. What I do? Anybody else get? A different we're getting all sorts of numbers out here including me so I did something I messed something up um, let's find it this is where like you don't get an answer that works let's let's go back and check our calculator so 2 times 10 times 5 uh, plus 1 half times 2 times 9 times 9 Okay, so the second time I put that in my calculator, I think I got the right answer of 328. Anybody else get 328? And then if I divide that by 18, I get a dy of 18.2. So the second time I put this in my calculator, I get the 328. I don't have a calculator. Rule number one, go back and watch math. Buy the either TI-36 or Casio 115. you got to get used to using the calculator. Because it's just, it, man, it's, it's, oh, so, oh, I, ah, what else can I say? Because uh, obviously, like, even I know how to use a calculator. And the first time through I did it, I broke down, or I got 256, which is just wrong. Okay. And so, so go get a calculator. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know what to say. Anybody else can verify the, the 18.2? I, I mean, I, I verified it somewhere else here, but uh, honestly, you know. One of the things that I did honestly before, before even this session here was I opened up a structural analysis program called Visual Analysis. I use that often for uh, checking stuff like this, and I'm just pulling it up here. But that's that's what I use oftentimes to check. You don't get the the, the benefit of something like that on the FE. So uh, normally I don't show you how to do that. But you know if we want to take a look at that here, uh, that's where did it go? I don't even know where it is. Uh, but yeah, so that's like, that's similar to this problem, but you can look at the result and we get an 18.2. So, uh, you know, I, I'm happy with it. 5 a.m. Oh man, 
Uh, this is I love this. This is awesome. I, normally, like nine o'clock is good because like, East Coast West Coast works, but this is awesome where we can even go cross cultural and uh, across the Atlantic. So this is this is awesome. So glad to have and have you join us. Um, but yeah, so what we get here is we have uh, we should be at eighteen kips. Okay. We're, we're just going here. So centroids. Centroids, ooh, you, this is where you might want to understand where this comes up in the manual. This one, honestly, do you need the manual for it? No, you don't, but you might not remember the centroid formula. If you don't remember the centroid formula, that's okay, but you should probably learn uh, where it is. It, and it, you know, it's, it's good to understand how to use the manual. So if we do a, a control find centroid, we get this this equation here, right? So so this is where we get an equation. And this equation, I, I mean, we get a centroid of an area. This, uh, what is it? There's this sigma, that Greek term again, of y times a over a. And let's go let's go play that out for a second. But 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 before we go there, remember how I said you have to kind of know that sum of moments equation. This is so like the sum of moments equation because it basically is the same thing, right? Remember when we had that question earlier where we were, where we were trying to balance this thing? What did we do? We essentially took the sum of moments and divided it by the sum of forces. Remember that? This was like a force times the distance, the sum of the force times the distance divided by the sum of forces. And that's really, really, really similar to um, what we're going to do here because what we're going to do here is we're going to say the centroid equals the sum of a y divided by the sum of a. You see, it's, it's, it's really kind of a similar thing. And when I do questions like this, oh man, that's awesome. That's so, that's so cool. So last week we had people from Ethiopia and Canada and now we get even to go to um, Africa. So, oh no, we had to guess Ethiopia and Africa too, but um, this is awesome. So thank you uh, for joining us. And what do we get here? So what we're doing is we got Let's, the way that I like to do this uh, is, 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 is like this, right? Where we got one and, and two, right? So we got two different areas. I like to just break it up like this and make a table. And, you know, basically what I'm going to do here is I'm going to write the part, part one, part two. I'm going to write A, I'm going to write Y, I'm going to write AY, and we're just going to solve this, right? So what do we get? We get the, the area of, of part one here right, this is the area of part one, is just going to be the four times eight, which is going to be 32 millimeters squared. And interestingly enough, if we look at it down here, we get the same thing. We get, um, you know, that I didn't try to make this too overly complicated with the geometry, although I have to admit the first time I did this question, I made a mistake and it just drove me nuts. But um, what do we get here? We get 32 millimeters squared. Okay. Area, not, not too crazy, we sum that up, we get 64 millimeters squared. This is our sum of our area. All right, and then what do we do next? Well, what we do next is we want to go and basically look at these, these Y values. What's Y? Y is the distance from a reference axis. So, so here I'm gonna take my reference axis is, uh, is down to the bottom of, uh, of where this Y bar is that we're calculating, which is the X axis up to the centroid of the part. So again, the centroid of a rectangle is the middle of it. So I'm gonna take this distance, kind of like, this is gonna be like Y2, and this distance here is kind of gonna be like Y1. So if we know those distances, that's gonna be, that's gonna be what we're finding uh, over here. So, for, so Y1, we essentially have to add four plus eight over two, which is gonna get us to uh, eight millimeters. And then Y2, is just gonna be half of this four, so four over two, which is gonna be two millimeters. So we multiply those out, 32 times eight, and we get uh, 32 times eight, what do we get? I think 256 uh, millimeters cubed, and two times 32 is 64 millimeters cubed. We add those up, this is our sum of AY, and I think that's 320 uh, millimeters cubed, okay? So I'll move that up a little bit. But again, that, now, now all we're doing is we're kind of doing this, this, this mass balance essentially, and we're getting Y bar equals 320 uh, millimeters cubed divided by, what was it, 64 millimeters squared. 
And 320 over 64 is actually works out to be a nice number of 5.00 millimeters. So, you know, it's centroid, not a, not a super crazy concept, but if you think of it, it's sort of a mirror of that sum of moments divided by sum of forces, equilibrium type of thing as well. And if you can remember this equation, great. If not, uh, go look it up in the manual. Okay. So, so we'll keep going. Okay, so centroids, I, I, I think they'll be on there. Honestly, I do. Uh, moment of inertia is definitely going to be on there. Again, I talked to somebody who just took it in January. He said definitely saw moment of inertia. And that's something, you know, it's not super crazy, but it's something that you need to know. And if we come back and take a look at moment of inertia, what we're trying to find for this question is the moment of inertia about the x-axis. -ax so we only have a couple questions left, but let's, let's get into them here. Uh, moment of inertia about the x-axis. Uh, again, if we come back here uh, to our... Our, our equations this is where sometimes it just gets overwhelming because you look at this and you think like oh man i thought Matson said all we need to know is some moments and some uh you know some, some trig and now 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 we got some calculus thrown in here and you can solve these with calculus you can solve moment of inertia with calculus but but don't okay <laughs> the, the reason i say that is because uh, there's an easier way to do this, right? So if we come down here, one of the things that you have to see in the manual is there are some standard shapes. And for example, the standard shape of a rectangle is one of those one of those ones that you're gonna uh, possibly use. So we see here that I X C the the moment of inertia about the centroid of that is dh cubed over 12. Okay, so this this rectangle, the moment of inertia about the x axis about its centroid is bh cubed over 12 so let's come back here and we see a channel okay and when I see this channel I see it differently than maybe you do when I, I mean maybe you learn the moment of inertia formula equals this this parallel axis there and where you get some I naught plus 80 squared and, and you have to go through and honestly if we come back to the manual that's probably in here right so and we'll use that later on let's come back we'll come back to friction uh, let me zoom out here a little bit, but yeah, I mean like the, here's the parallel axis theorem. It doesn't really say the sum of, it doesn't say it the same way. So honestly, this is one of those equations where it'd be, it'd be nice to know. Uh, oh no, is that, that's, that's different. Let's look, let's come up here. Oh, here's the parallel axis theorem. Sorry. I, I was looking at the wrong spot. So basically what's this is it's the, the moment of inertia about the centroid plus the distance from the centroid squared times the area. So when you see something like this, you might think parallel axis theorem, but when I see something like this, I try to simplify it. And the reason I throw these on the review is because there's like, this is one of those tips and tricks that kind of help. Uh, we just looked up the formula for rectangle, which was B H N I X C about the centroid is B H cubed over 12. So we just looked that up. When I look at this channel, what I see is I of a big box minus I of a little box. And you're thinking like, what are your boxes, Matson? And, and that's okay, you can think that. But what I think of is I think of a big box, right? So that's this big box uh, minus the I of this little box, right? And in what we can do is because these boxes share the same horizontal axis of symmetry, we can just add and subtract them. It only gets to the point where you have these terms when they don't share this same axis of symmetry. So here, this question actually boils down a little bit easier. What we're saying is the I of the big box is gonna be what? It's gonna be four times 10 cubed over 12, right? So that's this one here is the kind of the big box. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna subtract off, what do we have? We have, this is like three, so three times uh, six cubed over 12. Okay, and this is kinda of like, if I can keep the page set, sorry about that. Uh, I was trying to flip my marker, but this is kinda of like the little box. So that gets us our whole moment of inertia. And it's it's kind of a shortcut. Don't worry if you if you really really wanted to see the the parallel axis theorem in its full glory, we will uh, we'll take a look at it. And you could you could go back and solve this problem uh, using the parallel axis theorem. Uh, but you know if we if we take a look at this four times ten cubed over twelve, uh, that's going to be like 
333 minus 3 times 6 times 6 times 6 divided by 12. That one is uh, 54. And the I total is going to be 333 uh, minus the 54. It's going to be like about 279.3. So the 280 looks good. And we will we'll circle that one. Make a little bit of sense? So this is going to be centimeters for the four. Let's keep going because I, I do want you to see the, the parallaxis theorem in its full glory here. But again, the same type of thing. We have the moment of inertia by the x-axis -x -axis is most nearly. So same type of thing. Uh, this is, uh, you know, i equals the sum of i naught, or, or I, I think the way the manual puts it, i x c about the centroid plus uh, the ad squared term. And, and they, they call this the dy term, you know, and that's okay. So, so we can use that. And with this one, what I see is, is some shapes again. I like to break this into smaller shapes. So I see a, a couple circles. I see a rectangle. Okay. And, you know, the, the shortcut might be to think like, okay, well, 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 can I just come up with an equivalent rectangle? And that's really dicey. It's really dicey because this, this AD squared term uh, influences it quite a bit. So let's just, let's work that out. So to, to work this out, uh, I'm just going to make a table, just like we did for the centroid. I'm going to make a table for the moment of inertia. So I'm going to label some parts here. I'm going to do part one, part two, and part three. And then I'm going to come down here and I'm going to say part, you know, one, two, and three. Okay. And what do we get? We get uh, the, the base moment of inertia, Ixc. And let's, let's do that. I'll start with part two because we already know that a rectangle is bh cubed over 12. So we just looked that one up. Let's start with that, with that one because that one's, we know that. It's so 1 times 6 cubed over 12. Uh, I think, what do we get for that? We get, eh, if I get on the right page here, I think that works out to 18, uh, 18 centimeters to the fourth. Okay, and now we have to come back here to IXC for a circle. And this one you might not remember, but if you know that you can look this up, it's a lot easier than integrating a circle formula. Uh, you can come down here and you can, uh, let me zoom out a little bit so that we can get down to the right page kind of quickly. Let's look for a circle. There's our circle. And what do we get? We get the IXC is pi a to the fourth over four, where a is what? The radius. Okay. So let's come back here and we'll write that in. We get a circle and we get pi a to the fourth over four. And what do we get? We get pi times a. In this case, if we have a two centimeter circle, uh, the radius is gonna be one centimeter radius. Okay, so what's that? One, uh, one to the fourth over Four. And you'll have to apologize. I'm leaving the centimeter units kind of off there just, just for the sake of space. But basically what this works out to is pi over four centimeters to the fourth. Okay. And it's going to be matched down here because those, those dumbbells on either side are the same. Okay. So once we do it for the top, it's the same for the bottom. So we get this IXC term. We can add all that up. So pi over four plus pi over four uh, is going to be about 19.5 five seven centimeters to the fourth and you can see that our values in the answers are far far off of that right so what that means is this ad squared term has quite an impact okay so let's look at our area our distance and our ad squared so i like to set this up in a table it makes a lot of sense to me uh circles uh, hopefully you know a circle the formula for a circle is pi r squared or pi a squared in this case for the formula. I mean, these, these are the IXC formulas. Uh, circle, just pi r squared. So pi times one squared. Okay, so that's just gonna equal pi centimeters squared. Uh, the area for the rectangle is gonna be one times six centimeters. So uh, that's gonna be six centimeters squared. And then this one down here, the other circle is just gonna be pi centimeters squared. Okay, distance. What's the distance? The distance is the distance from the neutral axis or the center of this thing. And because this thing is or, or has horizontal symmetry, right? It's symmetry, it has a horizontal axis of symmetry, I should say. Uh, basically, what we're saying here is, is, is we know that this distance is the distance from the centroid. This is the distance 
from the total centroid to the centroid of the part, right? So if the centroid of this circle is right there and the centroid of the total is right there, this distance is going to be what? It's going to be half of the 6 and half of this 2, so that's going to be 4 centimeters. Okay, so that's going to be 4 centimeters. I, and it's going to be actually the same down here. It's going to be 4 centimeters. And I don't care about the plus and the minus because ultimately uh, that term gets squared anyway, so I don't really care about the plus or minus. Uh, the distance between... Right, this 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 middle though, the distance between the, the, the middle of part two and the center of the whole thing, because it's, it has that horizontal axis of symmetry in the middle, this is just going to be uh, this is going to be zero here. So this term just goes away for the ad squared term. But what we can see here is we get essentially uh, what four times four is sixteen. Sixteen times pi. So this is going to be like what sixteen pi, uh, and this is going to be like sixteen pi. So this is going to be like, what, 32 pi? Okay, and if we add that, this is centimeters to the fourth. If we add those up, the total moment of inertia is just going to be 19.57 plus six, there, 32 pi. And that's going to equal, what, 19.57. If I can put it in my calculator, right, that helps to 0.57 plus uh, 32 pi. I'd also recommend getting the calculator just because Sometimes, like, as you get used to using it, you realize as you're punching things, you didn't press the button quite right, and it, and it helps. You know you, you know when to pause and when to stop, and we can see that this total moment of inertia is 120 centimeters to the fourth. All right. But again, that, that, this table is going to be useful to setting it up, to making it work, and, and hopefully it helps you as well. All right. We will keep going here. We got two questions left. Uh, friction is the last question that kind of gets thrown in at statics. Really, the biggest thing with friction is is the friction force equals mu times the normal force. So we can go look that up in the for, in the in the manual. But if you know that friction is just the the coefficient of friction times the normal force, you're good. So this this question is set up that you got two blocks. Uh, this the first the top block here. Is restrained against the wall it's got a you know something holding it against the wall so it won't move okay but what we're trying to do is just pull out this bottom block of, of three kips we're just trying to pull that one out and we're saying okay how, how's that gonna work so we're given some information we're told that the coefficient of friction between the blocks is 0.55 between the block and the horizontal surface is 0.4 and we want to find this force P so that the bottom block can move okay so what's that gonna look like well, we want to find the, the force P. That's going to look like, let's draw a free body diagram. So, so we have this, you know, three kip block here. And what we have is we have essentially seven kips acting down. We got some force of friction from the top. We have some force of friction uh, for the bottom. And then we're going to have some normal force, you know, down here as well. The last, last force here is this, this force P that we're trying to solve for. So here, right, this is where we just have one equation now. Some of the forces in the x direction uh, equals zero. And what we know is essentially we have minus the force of friction at the top, uh, minus the force of friction at the bottom, and plus P has to equal zero. And if we only knew what the forces of friction were, we'd be good, right? So the other thing that we can look at here is we can we can actually write our sum of forces in the y direction equation. We can say sum of the forces in the y direction equation equals zero, and we can get this normal force equals what? It's essentially seven kips plus three kips equals uh, ten kips. So the total normal force down here is going to be that ten kips. But what we what we're looking for here is we're looking for minus the force of friction top. So what's the force of normal at the top times you know the, the coefficient of friction for the top you know minus the the force normal at the bottom times the you know mu for the bottom the coefficient of friction for the bottom and then this is going to be plus p equals zero so i need a little bit more room here and i get the benefit of being able to do this digitally so i'm just going to move this down uh, but you know what we're doing here is is essentially this force of normal at the top, I'm just going to, because these are both negatives here, I'm going to put them to the other side. I'm going to say P equals, what, the force of normal at the top is just the 7 kips, times the mu at the top. If you remember, that one was, what, 0.55? 0.55.
And then we're going to add in the force of normal at the bottom, which is 10 kips uh, times 0 0.4. And that's going to equal, I think, 7 point, what was it, 7 point something. It was 7 point 85, I think, when you do this out. All right, so we're, we're doing all right there. You're just warming up with friction. Don't worry, it'll get more complicated. <laughs> you know, and, and that's the thing. It's like we take these kind of, these, these concepts, and it's like, can you apply this concept, right? That's, that's kind of the way it goes. Can you apply this concept? Last question of the night, and then we will call it a night here. But the last question of the night is, is this, right? Uh, what do we have? We have a block with a mass of 200 kilograms on an inclined plane, and we're told that this angle is, let me get the right pen here, that this angle is 15 degrees. So we have a static or coefficient of friction, uh, we have a mass, right? So we've got 200 kilograms, we got 0.35, we got an angle of 15, and this force P acts horizontally through the center of mass of the body. The magnitude of the force P that will cause the motion to begin up the plane is most nearly you'll love the the fe language is most nearly right so so what do we have this is where it helps to draw a good free body diagram and definitely 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 it helps to know some trig here so so the trig and geometry are really the the hardest part of this this question um first before we do anything else i'm just going to say force equals mass times acceleration so this is going to be 200 kilograms uh, times 9.81 uh, meters per second squared, and that's going to be this force of this this mass is going to be 200 times 9.81. 200 times 9.81 is what 1962 newtons. Okay, so we know that this you know mass is like 19 uh, having a, an effect of 1962 newtons acting down. We also know that there's going to be some normal force uh, acting up, so this is going to be the normal force. We also know that we have some force P that's acting horizontally. Uh, let me draw that a little bit more horizontal. And the last force that we have on our, on our free body diagram is going to be this friction force, so the force of friction that acts along the surface. So what I like to do when I'm solving this, this type of a problem is I like to align my, my coordinate system so that X follows my force of friction. That's just the way that I like to do it. So I have my X and my Y, but I like to rotate my coordinate system. Sometimes that helps for these problems, sometimes it doesn't, but for this one I like to do that. So what does that mean? So that means we're pretty good with like our force of friction and our normal force because those line up with our, uh, our coordinate system, okay? But what we see here is the forces that don't line up with the coordinate system we have to apply some trig. So we know that this 1962 and this P, they do not line up with our coordinate system, so we need to uh, deal with those. Okay, so let's do that. And what does that look like? Well, what that looks like is I'm gonna draw in some components here. And I like to do those in a different color if possible, but this is, I'm just gonna call this Fy and this one Fx, right? We called this, this, this force F over here, so I'm gonna call this Fy and Fx. And then similarly, we're gonna have some component uh, Px and some component Py. Okay, it looks complicated, and honestly, it is complicated. Are you gonna get a, for, uh, a question this complicated on the FE? I don't know, you might. Uh, is it good to know how to do? I think it is. Uh, I've seen this type of question. This is kind of a classic friction question, a block on a plane what forces whether it's going up the plane or down the plane or staying at rest of the plane or maybe there's a pulley acting down and this thing's moving and acceleration on the plane i mean there's all sorts of crazy ways you can manipulate this problem so let's just let let's send it home and, and be done with this right so let's find our components right so that's what we want to do here is we want to find our components uh so what we want to find is the components of fx equals fy equals and uh, px equals and py equals and to do that, what we want to see is, or what we want to figure out is what angle shares this 15 degrees. And hopefully if you draw a decent free body diagram, you can see that, right? This angle here shares that 15, and this angle here shares that, shares that 15. So once you know cosine, you remember cosine is, is we started, this is where we started, right? Cosine's adjacent over hypotenuse, right? So the cosine's always adjacent to the angle, right? So, so that's, that's the way I can remember it, but fx 
if if we know that the fy fy here is adjacent to that 15 degrees i'm going to start with fy is f times the cosine of 15 so that makes uh, that makes fx f times the sine of 15. okay and similarly if we look at this px value down here uh, px is adjacent to that 15 degree angle so px is going to be uh, p times the cosine of 15 and PY is going to be P times the sine of 15. So the good news is, the good news is we are, we have F, so we can we can do these out. So 1962 times uh, the sine of 15 is going to be like 50. I'm just going to round up to 508 newtons. And I could go for a fig newton right now. And the, I, you guys are probably like eating and like drinking and like hopefully nothing like alcoholic because that makes it harder to do the FE. I'm just saying. But maybe you'll go celebrate after. I don't know. Like it's not, it's not my thing, but maybe it's your thing. So what are we doing? 1895. Or maybe you just make a cake when you're all done. Oh man, now I'm getting hungry. Um, so 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 we got these four, we got these values, but we don't know what p is yet. Okay, but we can solve for it. So let's just go down. And this also, if if you look at it, this also looks a little bit like. Method of joints. If you remember method of joints, what did we have? This is this. Is, we essentially don't have any distances here. We just we have two equations. We have some of the forces in the x direction equals zero, and we have some of the forces in the y direction equals zero. We have two two equations here. Sorry, my. We have two equations that we need to use to solve this thing. All right. So let's start with some of the forces in the y direction, just because that one's a little bit simpler. So what we have is the normal force minus p y. Uh, minus Fy equals zero. So those are the vertical forces. Okay, makes some sense. So we have the normal force minus Py minus uh, you know the normal force is going up. All right, this is going up. Py is going down. Fy is going down. And uh, we get one equation. So what else do we get here? So so if we look at in the x direction, what do we get? I'm going to sort of try this in the same direction. I'm going to start with minus Ff. Uh, plus px minus fx equals zero. And when I'm doing these problems, I try to keep them in the same order here, like n and p and f, all in the same order, just because it actually helps when you start to do either elimination or substitution, because what ultimately you're gonna end up with is a formula with two equations and two unknowns, right? The unknowns that we have are essentially, uh, it, it, the normal force in, in P. Okay, so so they, you, you know, when we get this P component that adds to the normal force, and we don't know what P is yet, we end up with an equation uh, with a system of equations that we need to solve. But we can start substituting in here because we also know that the friction force equals mu times the normal force. So what I can do here is I can say, well, this is minus mu times the normal force plus, and instead of Px, I'm gonna use P cosine 15. P cosine 15, and I'm going to say this equals fx. All right, I'm going to put the fx on the other side. I'm not trying to do smoke and mirrors here, but then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say the normal force minus py, and instead of py, I'm going to use p sine 15, and that's going to equal fy. Okay, so what you see all of a sudden is this is a this is a system of two equations. Uh, two unknowns and you should be able to actually just go and solve this so I'm gonna put in some I'm gonna start substituting in our mu what was it it was 0.35 up here so minus uh, minus 0.35 n plus what's cosine 15 I don't know uh, cosine 15 is is 0 0.9659 so 0 0.9659 p equals fx and fx was 508 okay what else do we get we have the normal force here which is n minus uh, p times the sine of 15 so what do we get there so if we do that out this is like 0 0.2588 uh, p equals FY, what's FY? 1895 newtons. Okay. And 
you know, I don't have my calculator set up anymore. But what I want you to see here is you can, if you, like on the TI-36X um, Pro, it's it's not really working wonderfully here, but uh, if you, on the TI-36X Pro, there is a system of equation solver. So if you do like a second tangent here, and if you have this calculator, you can use this to solve. But a second tangent, you can put in a uh, second tangent, and you can do, I don't know if you can see it, but you can do, yeah, it's backwards, a two by two linear system, uh, linear equation. So this is gonna be super helpful in when we get something like this. And if I put that in here, and again, it, this is this is kind of not working. Uh, I, I changed my cameras around last time because it didn't work very well for me, but Basically, you can put that in here, uh, and you can solve a linear system in your calculator, which is a lot easier than doing uh, elimination or substitution on the test. So, so if you want to do elimination substitution, you can. Otherwise, yeah, you can't read it. But um, what we get here is we essentially get that the the p force equals, uh, I believe it's thirteen thirty seven, and the n force equals twenty two forty one newtons so if you solve you know i'm just going to do dot 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 this is the system solver on ti 36x pro or you know you use you know elimination or substitution right and you'll be able to to go ahead and solve these to get those values Okay, but the real crux of this is is what it's it's just like I said in the beginning, right? It's knowing the sum of the forces equation, sum of the forces equation, some basic trig to to meet your geometry. You put all those together and you can do statics. So 100%, I know if you've made it this far, you care enough to actually make it, and I know you you'll be able to. So so I I think statics is so important to start with because. Uh, well, math and statics, those two, I mean, if you can do these basic pieces, this will apply towards everything else, you know, and what that does, honestly, I love seeing people from across the world. It's it's so awesome here. I, I worked with a, a group uh, that, that at one point said, you know, poverty isn't lack of money. Poverty is lack of opportunity. And one thing I love about this platform is it is it gives the opportunity for my current students, for my, you know, new students, uh, the opportunity to learn. And I totally love uh, the fact that you, that this opportunity is available for you. And you know what? We'll just end it right there. So so what we'll say is the, the, the beautiful thing about this is this course is all about statics, right? Where everything is set still. And this is amazing because even though it's static, you're still full of potential. <laughs> that wasn't really funny, but I tried. Hey, um, quick question. My TI36 isn't giving me the decimal forms. So decimal forms... Yeah, so totally um, decimal forms. So so decimal forms. There's there's a bottom button here. I don't know if you see it. It's right above uh, right above the enter sign. So right above the enter sign, this button will change from uh, this button will change from uh, uh, what is it called? Um, radical form to decimal form. So if or you can go instead of cl uh, the uh, math print, you can go to classic print. Uh, in your in your options. So if you either go to classic print in your options or this button literally right above the enter button will change from radical form to decimal form. So I don't know if that helps you, Sammy. Um, but yeah, so what gets the ball rolling? This, this is your potential, right? And we'll talk about dynamics at some point. But what gets the ball rolling? I mean, come on, we're doing an FE review course. This is FE pass, right? This is what you guys are going to get and you're gonna you're gonna go there. So um, you're you guys are full potential. I'm so excited for you. Hey, and um, this time next week we should be doing structural analysis. We'll we'll keep going, and I'll post some questions here probably tomorrow or the next day. Uh, probably by Thursday I'll have them up. Uh, but you know, keep looking. And uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Till next time, keep working hard, moving onward and upward.